Greetings. Last time we fixed the status display for an Atari pinball and uh, I was going to put the whole machine together and do a quick follow-up but it turned out this machine was missing quite a few parts and was actually in much worse shape than I thought it was in. But I think I finally got it up and working. It's still a bit ratty. Needs some. The parts are all there but I think I need some new ones to make it look a little bit nicer, but uh, let's have a look at this machine today and uh, I'll give you a brief walkthrough of what I had to do to get it to this stage. There is the uh, status display we fixed and it's still working. The score display was completely missing. It's there, almost there. The fourth player score is missing a segment and also it's doing some weird ghosting every so often. As you can see it just disappeared and you can see on the bottom uh, player score and on the second one it's ghosting some numbers there. So this thing still got a problem. I, I didn't do that. I promise it just did it on its own. I mean it's normal because after a while it turns the scores off to save the displays but it just kind of glitched there and it continues glitching now. This came off of eBay. I had one bidder competing with me who drove the price up but I knew I needed it. It was advertised as coming out of a fully working machine and it didn't. It was glitching all over the place when I plugged it in. You couldn't see anything. I've done some repairs to it, but this is as far as I got. There's something wrong with the glass panel because the electronics are all working correctly. I tried it with a good glass panel and uh, so uh, this will need some work, but you can play and see the score for at least, well you can actually see the score for all four players but the fourth player's score may be slightly disfigured. But yeah, let's have a look and see what this guy needed. So here's under the hood or bonnet if you like. Most things actually seem to work here. The biggest problem was that a lot of the lamp sockets were had corroded contacts in them and that caused the lamps to either not work or come on very dimly. Some of them are still doing it even after filing the contacts so the uh, sockets that display this problem the worst will need to have to be replaced but so far so good. Other than that, you've seen, I've showed you the underneath of Playfield pinballs. This machine in particular too, but uh, it didn't take that long. It was mostly a labor of hate to clean lamp sockets and try to figure out if the, and after replacing a whole bunch of bulbs and seeing they still didn't work, finally figuring out that the sockets were at fault. A point of interest here is, is Normally, the flipper mechanisms look a lot like the, uh, for instance, these are the slingshot mechanisms here. And very traditionally, there's a solenoid that, when activated, pulls down an arm and activates the slingshots. Flippers are kind of the same, except that the solenoid pulls in and it rotates a shaft that rotates the flipper. On the early Ataris, or the Gen 1, the first few machines, the Gen 1 Ataris, they didn't use the traditional solenoid-driven flipper mechanisms, but rather they used motors. So these are DC motors, and when they get activated, they turn, turning the flipper, activating this switch to tell the CPU that the flipper has been activated, and uh, the flipper action is not very good, as you may have guessed. But rumor has it that Atari found a supplier of these uh, flipper mechanisms 
uh, close to their own manufacturing f facility and got them for a lot lower price than actually putting traditional solenoid driven flippers in there. This machine was what the third machine Atari built and uh, these motors all started to fail. They had a very high failure rate and uh, in the middle of the production run on this or on the next machine they switched over to traditional flipper mechanisms. These I got these to work they weren't working very well but uh, I cleaned up everything I uh, fixed the shafts on them and they work reasonably well so I'm going to leave them in. And you can see they use that approach for other things too. This thing here kicks the ball when the ball lands in the out hole, which this is. Normally you got a coil here that that sits, I guess, up here, and it kicks the ball so it goes to the feed lane. Well, they use another one of the motors here, and when it's activated, it goes up, puts up this little arm and kicks the ball in. There's one other instance and I don't know if that shows up, it's kind of hidden behind the ribbon cable but there's a ball saver gate which we can see on top later on over here and that one also utilizes a motor. When it's on it rotates to move the gate over and when it lets go pops back into place. The rest of the uh, as a matter of fact it's using the motors even more there's some further down the play field that kick out the balls there are two holes saucers that the ball can land in and they have those motor assemblies again one here and one back there that kick the ball out of the saucers and the rest of the mechanisms are traditional solenoid driven uh, uh, pop bumpers and uh, whatever else needs power but that that was one of the oddities in these valleys and they did uh, they did finally come to their senses and started using real flipper mechanisms but hey they work and we gotta keep things original. Other than that we had the main CPU board uh, that was very very dirty and now it's only very dirty but all that was wrong with it was that you can see the heatsink in the back left of the board and it had lost the 5 volt regulator all it needed was a new regulator and it sprung back to life and all of the edge connectors on there especially for the lights also uh, since the board was so dirty there was a lot of dirt on the edge fingers and things just weren't making proper contact so scrubbing those clean did actually originally bring back a lot of lamps to life after I had uh, cleaned the sockets there are the two connectors on the right and on the left are the solenoid connectors and uh, hidden partially by the ribbon cable there's another connector that is the uh, switch matrix. Following on the massive transformer assembly that thing's heavy. I mean most pinball machines are pretty massive transformers but this thing you probably block a door with it nobody could get in and what was remaining there's the auxiliary board over there what that board does is basically it does all the tasks that the main CPU board they couldn't fit on the CPU board I didn't want to it has the, the voltage supply and the control for the lamps it generates plus minus 90 volts for the displays and uh, has sound amplifiers and stuff like that or amplifier on it and that one didn't need anything any repairs of course one other thing I failed to mention was uh, the machine was inhabited by non-human squatters uh, 
it had been cleaned before I bought this machine. It had been vacuumed. There's still traces of there were still traces of lots of things in there. It took me a while to vacuum them all out. But as you can see, uh, clear proof is right here. This is an uh, instruction sheet for adjusting machine parameters that was mounted in here at some point in time. And uh, I guess uh, when the mice were reading this, they got excited and started snacking on it. But yeah, that got cleaned out. The inside of the cabinet got scrubbed down. Doesn't smell bad. But yeah, I guess the guy who sold me the machine saw me coming from miles away. The cabinet is in surprisingly good shape. From all of the uh, layers of dust, I figured out that the machine was basically sitting on its back end without the legs, of course. The uh, playfield the, the play glass was missing, so it sat there without a playfield glass. It must have been incredibly filthy, but uh, it had been cleaned up hurriedly before I bought it, so it didn't look too bad, and the playfield cleaned up pretty nicely. Coin door is in great shape. Normally these things are kicked in. Uh, they're pretty sturdy, but people get pretty angry when they when it eats your quarters and they kick them rather hard. But this one is straight, looks nice. Needs some more cleaning up and polishing. I probably have to take it apart. But uh, this is what's called uh, the Atari Allies uh, uh, coin door, or the, the, the coins go into the owl's eyes. I guess that's the owl's nose. And that's the owl's mouth. So all of that is there. there. are a lot of scuffs on the cabinet, but it's structurally sound. And that's about all I can say about the cabinet. Oh, another thing is, as I was trying to say, another thing is, probably can't tell from there, but the legs are one inch too short. So it's kind of weird when you put this next to another Atari machine because uh, the game just sits too low. I got the proper legs, but yeah, I gotta go sand and paint them and do all of that good stuff, and I think that can wait. So back to the score display. It's not a capacitor problem because the machine's been on for a few minutes and it's doing the exact same thing. I did repair it because it was completely, I mean, just flashing random segments on and off. And now it's actually, let me put it in test mode so you can see a real display. As you can see, it's it's very readable. But you know, it's another thing of dishonest sellers on eBay. Yeah, it works work great. Yeah, everything worked great at some point in life, but, uh, you know. So you may say, well, why, why didn't I just use eBay's excellent uh, buyer protection and return it? And the answer to that is, is I need this panel. I mean, having a messed up panel is better than not having any panel at all. But, you know, I'm still not overly happy that, you know, people just sell you junk on eBay. But anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. And other than that, you can see one of the nastiest parts on here. This crack going through here. That is not in the display. That is in the, uh, the it's called the plastic lower apron. And this basically covers the lower part of the play field. In most modern machines, it's made out of metal. But on Atari's, it's a large plastic piece that is just screwed down. This machine came with a box of parts. Or no, actually there were bits and pieces of this lying inside the cabinet, the bottom of the cabinet. Uh, and uh, the majority of pieces was there. I didn't even attempt to super glue this because the pieces are too large and would break off immediately. So I used the transparent packing tape just to hold it together. Until I find one. You can see the corners are chewed up. Those weren't the rodents. That was just some idiot who ripped this thing out of the machine 
it's screwed down in places like that and I can just see him grabbing this thing from here and just ripping it off. It'll do, it'll hold the instruction card and it'll cover the ugliness underneath, but uh, yeah, that needs to be replaced. So, uh, the rest of the playfield cleaned up very nicely, especially for a playfield that had been left open to whatever elements it was close to as it was stored. There is quite a bit of rust I found. Okay, let me get it out of test mode so we can see the flashy lights. It cleaned up nicely. The rubbers were petrified and crumbling. The rubber rings. These things and uh, those got replaced, everything got cleaned up. You can see it's nice, but some of the bulbs on the very top of the play field they were working perfectly when I cleaned it up and they're failing one by one and uh, some of them when you tap them they come back on so those sockets are really badly corroded. But other than that things look kinda... things came out pretty nice. So what I need, of course, yeah, I think the, the thing that's needed most is the lower apron cover and a working display. But uh, the machine's fully playable and uh, it'll probably go next to the other two Ataris I have left. Another one saved from the uh, garbage dump. First a little history on this game. This was designed in 1977 by a pinball designer named Steve Ritchie. Steve Ritchie has become one of the most well-known designers of pinball machines. And uh, supposedly this was the first commercial pinball machine he designed. It, uh, one of his trademarks are shots that I shall call bait and switch, or more accurately, bait and sacrifice. He will put a shot on the play field that will give you lots of points. In this case, the captive ball right in the middle. If you hit it right on and hard enough, it will travel all the way up over the rollover and hit the target back here. Adds to your bonus, adds points, and it's generally very good. Uh, for your score in general. But, as you probably would have guessed by the geometry of this, if you make the perfect shot where the ball you're hitting lands right in between these two posts, it will propel the ball up and it does need a bit of force to make it all the way up and hit this target and activate it. But guess what? It'll come straight down and drain. So the bait are the points you can make and the switches or the sacrifices that there's a high chance of losing the ball. But that's not all. Because of the proximity of these two posts to the flippers, this is a pretty short distance, if you don't make the shot right, these posts will make the ball go off in weird trajectories, which more often than not will result in the ball draining out the left or right side. He kept up that tradition and uh, most of his games have one or more of these uh, bait and sacrifice shots in them. And uh, that's just a trademark of his. This game in particular shows that he was still a bit green when he designed this. but. Historic, it's a historically significant game. So let's have a look and see uh, if we can get bait, baited and sacrificed, baited and sacrificed by the design of this play field. Some of my viewers who are young and have much better hearing than me will probably be bothered by the high-pitched noise that the machine is emitting. This is caused because of lamp switching on and off. It's a common pinball problem that gets worse the older 
the machine is, the older the technology is, but it's there. Tomes have been written on the internet about how to defeat it, but uh, I have been unsuccessful in getting rid of that noise here, so it is what it is, but at least when you're playing a game you can't really hear it. So let's give it a whirl. And off we go. That was a perfect bait and uh, sacrifice. I couldn't have planned it any better. As you can see, there's a lot of open spaces on the play field, and there are long periods of time where the ball really doesn't do anything, then just roll around. Uh, this is a super wide body machine, and I think if they had made a normal sized, width sized machine, the action would have been a lot better. But. There's just little action here. So, <laughs> there was a second one. Let's try some other shots here. And there was a bait and sacrifice out of the left side. Okay, that was a really poor performance. Let's uh I got 32,500 points. Let's see if we can increase the score a little bit. Things are awfully quiet. There's no background music. And it's not hitting too many things on the play field. Can't even hit the middle anymore. Well, I'm at 26,800. So it was a really nice shot and got me 2,000 points. Come on, we only need 2,000 more. Actually, we have the bonus. Come on, 
One more. There you go. Well, I beat my last score. I got 52,540 points, but as you can see, no matter how much I tried, the play action, there's a lot of dead ball time on this thing. It's a pinball historical artifact, but uh, I don't think this is going to be getting played too much. But I'm still glad I have it, so thanks for watching. Please leave a thumbs up, a comment, a like, and share it. And we'll see you next time.